Thank you so much for having us. Um, how many people were here last time when I gave a talk? Good. Um, not very many. So, um, um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go over some of what we talked about last time because this is kind of, for us, contextual. What we're going to be talking about today sort of fits in with what we were talking about last time as an introduction. So I'll give you that so everybody will sort of understand why we're doing this. Um, there's a couple more chairs if people want them. Uh, we should probably bring in a couple more. Pascal, in case I'll bring people in come. Okay. Um, so um, I'm Rand Gruen. Um, uh, I'll give you my background. This is Debbie Volker. Um, we work together. Um, we have been working together for quite some time. You should get a chair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you can be tired by it. Um, uh, so in terms of my background, um, I, um, I trained at Berkeley and Yale. I um, was an assistant professor at NYU for many years, and I actually did some consulting for businesses. Um, I'm a people person, so I did people things, um, like leadership development and teams and things like that. Uh, and then um, I started the center, which I'll talk about um, about 13 years ago. And um, I'm running that now. Um, Debbie's a part of that, an integral part of that, uh, for many years. And um, I'm an assistant clinical professor at Yale in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, do you want to give your background? Sure. Um, I'm Debbie Bolger. And as Rand said, we've been working together for um, some time. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a learning specialist. Um, I started my um, career working with um, patients with traumatic brain injury. Um, and then shifted into the um, school system where I was at a private school um, doing teaching um, and counseling and working with kids um, for academic support. Um, I did that for about 15 years and I've been in private practice the whole time um, in addition. So um, ask questions, interrupt me. Um, I don't like to stand up here and talk. I've heard myself before and so um, I like the back and forth. Um, so I'm going to sort of give an overview and then I'll wrap things up and Debbie will talk about what we're here for specifically um, because that's her area of expertise in particular. So, let's see, okay. So what, just in terms of the context, I was here about um, two and a half months ago. Um, the, the talk was focused on, in general, parenting and teens and um, this is really part of a larger effort for us to educate parents um, and help kid, help them teach their kids better coping strategies. So I'm going to review some of what I said. Um, Debbie's going to take over, and then I'll wrap things up um, at the end, like I said. And uh, we're going to talk about um, attentional issues and executive function issues. So. Um, Debbie will talk about, after I give the overview, um, common problems with attention and executive function, as well as symptoms of ADHD. They're not the same thing. Um, coping strategies that parents can use. She'll give some examples. Um, I'll talk about the consequences of not addressing these things, and then we'll talk just briefly about some of the research that we're doing at the Institute. So I've been doing this for 35 years, a long time, and um, you know, it's clear that parents play a huge role in their kids' development, but over the last um, five years or so, it's become increasingly clear to me how big of a role that is. I mean, we're clinicians. We see kids once a, a, a week, maybe twice a week. Um, sometimes we see parents and uh, the kids together. But you guys see your kids every day for hours and hours and hours a day. And so you have an enormous opportunity. And one of the things that happens is, I think parents don't know how to capitalize on that. They don't know exactly what to do. When I was a new parent, I mean, I was already a psychologist and I was seeing patients and um, I didn't know what to do. And I was thinking to myself, like, how is it possible that you know, humans have been having kids for <laughs> 70,000, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of years, and like you have a kid and like no one knows what to do. Everything is got completely new. I mean, how is that possible? Um, but I think you have the opportunity to um, help your kids recover from setbacks, insulate them, but I think you're an underutilized resource in the clinical process. And so when, when parents bring their kids in, 
we try to utilize and leverage what the parents can do as well as us working individually. This is not a handoff like, okay, my kid's got problems, please fix them. Um, you guys need to be involved because if we try to make changes and then you, they go home and things are disruptive or there's a lot of conflict or bad strategies, um, everything we do gets undone. And so from our perspective, this is part of why we're doing this. We want to give you guys the tools to, um, to do what you do better and to partner with us when, when you bring kids in. Um, so we want to give you skills to help your kids cope more effectively. And I believe that if, they, if you guys have these skills, you could help your kids avoid the development of more serious problems. So part of this is about prevention. It's not just about sort of education. It's about preventing mental health problems from becoming more um, solidified. So like I said, um, I've been doing this for 35 years. We started the center about 13 years ago. I've been seeing patients for that long, but um, the center was only started about 13. We've seen 500 families, which equates to about 700 patients because we see pay more than one person from the same family. Um, and you know, it's become clear to me that parents can be a source of support, you know, uh, advice, informational support, um, emotional support, tangible support, but they can also contribute to problems. And um, they can have parenting skill deficits, like they don't create boundaries, they're inconsistent or too rigid, um, they inadvertently enable dependency. There can be a lack of attunement between parent and child. And that's particularly important for what we're going to be talking about today. Parents bring their kids in, they say, I've got three kids, two of them are doing great, one of them is doing really badly, and I parented them all the same. I don't know what the problem is. And my, in, you know, my internal dialogue is, well, you parented them all the same. <laughs> that's part of the problem. Um, because kids are different, and they need different things from us and from you guys. And so you have to be very attuned to what your kids need. And again, that's a very simple concept, but I don't think parents necessarily focus on that. Like, okay, my kids just got born. What is he like now? What is he like in five years? What is he like in 15 years? People don't necessarily think that way. Um, sometimes parents don't see early warning signs where they could get help and head off problems later. Um, they can be overly critical and controlling. Um, leading to anger and anxiety in kids, and there can be family and marital conflict. Kids are sponges. They just absorb everything that's happening in the family. If you guys are fighting, um, you're fighting with your partner, they feel it. This is not just, okay, we're doing this and we're doing it. Even if you do it behind closed doors, they still soak it in because it leaks out all over the place. Um, in terms of ADHD and executive function in particular, sometimes parents don't have the skills they need to work with that particular kind of kid. Um, that's what Debbie's going to talk about. There's often, you know, you see these scenarios where a kid has, you know, attention deficit or they're hyperactive and you see parents sitting down with them, or I get the reports anyway, and the kid is like looking around and fidgeting, and I gotta go to the bathroom, I'm hungry, and the parent is taking an hour out of their day to help them, and what's gonna happen? They get frustrated. Um, this goes on day after day. They start yelling at their kids. The kids get, you know, I mean, I think they think it's gonna help, um, but it usually doesn't. Um, and um, it just solidifies everything. And one of the things that I say to parents when they bring their kids in and they, I talk about sort of what the back and forth is like, they, you know, I, I say, okay, let's stop for a minute. Imagine that um, you're a parent and you hire a coach, a tutor for your kid, and you walk into the kitchen where they're working with your kid and they're yelling at your kid. Like, what would you do? You would fire them, right? Um, but we don't sort of absorb that, that we do the same things. And, um, well, that's what we do. And so, that you need to do it differently, and it takes a lot of self-control, and it takes knowing what you need to do. Um, so Debbie will tell you. Um, you know, parents get frustrated, things escalate, um, and it only leads to more symptoms in the kid, or makes it more difficult for them to focus, because they're getting yelled at. 
Um, and then fair, marital and family conflict. I see this a lot. I, I'm the one who tends to work with families. Um, Debbie does too. Um, not everybody at the center does. Um, some are more individually focused. But um, parents disagree on how to manage these situations. It's not infrequent at all. And so one parent says, you know, he's messing around. Like, I won't be politically inappropriate. One parent um, says, you know, um, you need to be um, more structured. You need to punish him. If he's not doing what he needs to do, he needs to be punished. And then the other parent reacts to that and goes, wait, wait a minute, whoa, you know, I'm not. And so you've got this back and forth between the parents. They're disagreeing with each other. The kid sees all this. You know, mom and dad are fighting like, and I'm in trouble, and I don't know what to do here. And then, um, and it can get really bad. Like they stop, you know, parents can sort of maintain resentment over time. Um, and it creates other problems in the family, in the larger family system, which I'll talk about later. Um, the research would support what I'm saying. So um, there are certain strategies that exacerbate symptoms. Um, inconsistent, punitive, and validating hostile. Um, that can make things worse for kids because it heightens their emotional dysregulation. Um, exacerbates attentional difficulties, undermines self-esteem, leads to other problems. There's a lot of comorbidity between ADHD and other issues. Do you know what I mean by comorbidity? Um, it's when it's co-occurrence. I've always felt like I've been doing this for 35 years. It's a terrible name. It's like everybody's dead. Um, but um, it means you know co-occurrence. And um, I'll have a slide at the end and talk about that. Um, and then there's other strategies that seem to help, or at least help the kid manage these problems. Positive reinforcement, consistent routines, effective communication between parent and child, and support and empathy. And so certain tactics can exacerbate things and others can improve. And we want to give you a sense of what you can do to either help manage the problem or improve it and prevent um, the development of more serious issues. So how are we going to do that? Um, these parent forums are an example of that. I'm giving others. Um, and um, it's fun. I enjoy doing this. So that's nice. But we only have 45 minutes or so. And we can't talk about everything we need to talk about, even within the ADHD and, um, and attentional ADHD and uh, executive function area. And so there's a lot of other issues that parents face, and the same kinds of things that I've been talking about are true. Um, you know, how do you, how do you parent your kids? Like when I had my I had two boys, they went through the Scarsdale system, so I'm you know this is sort of how they grew up, um, and. Um, what do you do? Like, you're, you know, I remember freaking out when my kid had a fever. Like, I call the pediatrician, the pediatrician say, just give him Tylenol, you know, not a big deal, and he's got a fever, and it's like, I don't know what to do. Um, I can tell you other more funny problems, but I won't. Um, and other things, like when you have a kid who gets depressed, or they're socially isolated, or they don't have, you know, just don't have friends at school, they're anxious, alcohol and drug use, LBGTQ issues, um, you know, that became much more prominent like five years ago. It was always there, but it became more prominent. Parents are talking about it and like, they don't have a clue about what to do with a lot of that. And so having experts to talk to and ask questions of can be very helpful. And doing the kinds of things that we're doing here, but we can't keep doing this at Edgemont. I mean, I don't know, I can talk to Pascal, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I developed an institute, the Family Development Institute. You can look at it, um, familydevelopmentinstitute.com. And we have, a, I think we have a nice group. Debbie's part of that. She'll talk about attentional issues in, you know, at the institute. And we're going to do workshops at the center because we have a nice place already. And um, you guys can come. Uh, and we can leverage a much wider range of experts and go into a much wider range of topics. So the objectives of that, both of these forums, are to give you guys knowledge, enhance your parenting skills, prevent more serious problems, and to create a low-fee alternative. So this is something I've struggled with since I started the center. We're, we're a little bit on the expensive side. I've never liked that because some parents can't utilize us because of that. And that's a problem with mental health more generally. We're not going to fix that today. But I wanted to create a low-fee alternative, low barrier. Uh, to entry 
And um, actually, since I was here two and a half months ago, I've decided to do, in, in the spirit of this, we've done away with the registration fee. We used to have a yearly registration fee, and we've got rid of that, and we've even lowered the fee for the individual workshops. So I want to make this ex as accessible for parents as possible. So, um, so the whole goal of both of these platforms is to give you guys an overview um, about what you could do differently, and then focus in on specific problems. ADHD and executive function is one example of that. And so I'm going to let Debbie take over, and she's going to talk about that piece in particular, um, and then I'll wrap things up at the end. That's right. Okay. So um, in terms of common symptoms, um, when we talk about um, attentional weakness, I'm not talking about diagnosed um, ADD or ADHD today. I'm just talking about um, symptoms of weaknesses in general. Um, these are very familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of you. Inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, forgetfulness, poor time management, disorganization, impaired working memory, and difficulty with follow through. So these are the most common um, symptoms. This list is not exhaustive. There's, there's, uh, and there's associated um, symptoms with this, but I'm just gonna stick with these for now in terms of um, common symptoms. Um, in terms of the prevalence of attentional weakness um, and executive function weakness, and I'll talk about the common symptoms of EF weaknesses in a minute, um, the CDC estimates that um, nearly 6 million, which is um, almost 10% of U.S. children that are aged 3 through 17, have an ADHD diagnosis. <coughs> boys are twice as likely to be diagnosed with a attention deficit than girls. <coughs> that does not mean, however, that boy, <coughs> that um, twice as many boys actually have attentional weaknesses. They're just more likely to be diagnosed with because the presentation um, often for girls and boys is very different. Part of that's the um, hyperactivity component and the behavioral um, issues that come along a lot of times with the presentation in boys. Um, the prevalence rate of executive functioning weakness actually varies across the research, and the reason for that is that um, EF, I just use that for short so I don't have to keep saying executive functioning, um, weaknesses are associated with a lot of different disorders. For example, people who are diagnosed with ADHD or ADD often have um, executive functioning weaknesses. Um, and uh, Asperger's, autism spectrum disorders, they also very uh, commonly co-occur with EF weaknesses. So the, the research is, um, and the statistics vary, uh, which is why I don't have a stat for that. So in terms of common symptoms of executive functioning weakness, one thing that you'll notice in this list is that there's a lot of overlap with the attentional weakness symptoms. Um, difficulty with planning and organization, impaired time management, trouble with flexible thinking, so um, often like some rigidity um, in the thinking, difficulty inhibiting responses, which is related to impulse control, um, difficulty with task initiation, which is why you see a lot of procrastination, um, impulsivity, forgetfulness. A lot of times you'll have kids say, I don't remember, um, or I forgot. Um, trouble with self-regulation, just in terms of their emotional regulation and frustration. <coughs> Distress tolerance is a big um, component of EF weakness. Um, and difficulty um, with overall problem solving. So one thing to note is that, um, as, as I said before, there's a lot of overlap between the, the symptoms, and that can make it really hard to distinguish what's actually going on, what's attention, what's executive functioning. Um, many people who have attentional weaknesses also have executive functioning weaknesses. However, it is entirely possible to have an executive functioning weakness without an attentional weakness. So I just wanted to make sure to, to clarify that. But it can get really confusing, and um, although this is probably for another talk, um, anxiety is another um, symptom that co-occurs often with both of these. So it can be very hard, um, not just for parents, but for clinicians to tease out what is actually at play here. Is this an attentional weakness? Is this an organizational weakness? 
And that matters because how you address it and how you help your child um, you know, depends on what's actually going on. So, you know, when I look at those lists, I think, oh, I mean, so many of them are like common, familiar for myself, for, you know, people in my family. When is it a problem? Like, how do I know what is an expected developmental deficit versus, you know, um, a clinical diagnosis? So it's very common for kids to display attentional um, difficulty, especially for tasks that are not as interesting, right? I mean, as adult, an adult, I feel that way too. It's hard for me to pay attention when I'm not interested in the subject matter. Um, that said, I have the capacity to do it, right? So we're talking about a capacity issue also. Over time, as kids develop and grow, their attention capacity also grows. Um, and that's the same with executive functioning. Um, you know, when they're very, very young, you know, three to five, they can't manage um, as much organization and independence as they can when they start to get older. So in both of these kinds of areas, you will see um, normal weaknesses, but they also should improve as they develop. So how do we know when they're not developing or improving as expected? So a clinical diagnosis is made when deficits are significantly impacting functioning. So from a clinical perspective, one of the questions that I always ask um, parents and families when they come in is, to what extent is this interfering with like daily functioning? Because that's really a, a good barometer um, to have a sense of um, how, how you know, significant it is. Um, so is there a significant impact in functioning? Um, and has it been present for more than six months? Um, so the clinical diagnosis, if, if there's a list of symptoms, and I'm going to go over them in a minute. If they're present for more than six months, um, and you have six or more symptoms of inattention, which I'll describe in a minute, six or more and or six or more symptoms of hyperactivity, and they all have to be present before the age of 12. Um, the symptoms need to be present in two or more settings. So it can't just be that like you see these things at home for your child, but then when you go to the school and you ask the teachers and they say, we've never seen anything like that. They're perfectly capable of attending and organizing and completing work. So you wanna make sure um, <coughs> that this is happening in more than one area. Can um, I interject for a minute? Sure. So it's interesting for us because, so you know, it's not terribly infrequent that parents will come in and they'll say, you know, he's like this at home, but the teachers say he's fine at school. Yeah. Like, he's not hyperactive, he doesn't get up and walk around. And like, as a clinician, you have to think to yourself, okay, why is that? And then, in my head, I go back to, okay, well, let's look at what's happening at home and how parents are responding to you. And so, you can create, um, you know, a fair degree of symptomatology based on what your reaction is to your kids and how tolerant you are or not tolerant. And so that's what Debbie's talking about is what you can see clinically is at school they're okay and at home they can't do anything. So it's very interesting. Yeah. So why the age 12, how is that relevant in terms of uh, the symptoms being present or not? So do you want to respond to that just in terms of? Right, so, uh, <laughs> right, um, so like I was saying before, there's expected um, weaknesses that occur over time, right? You, the um, diagnosed ADHD, for example, is a, um, a biological vulnerability, if you will. Um, so kids are born wired in a way that makes them um, vulnerable to these weaknesses. That doesn't show up in middle school. It's always been there. Right, and so we, and actually related to your question, the last point here is that the symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder. So very often, you will have symptoms that I referred to before, common symptoms of attentional weakness um, that could be better explained by an anxiety diagnosis, for example. So we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to what has always been present and is not 
um, just emerging because of a family dynamic, because of a social dynamic, because of another disorder. Um, and so that's why this criteria is really important. And some of this is um, sort of based on just research, you know, like people have been looking at this for 30 years, and it's typically the case that that's what happens. Same thing is true with spectrum disorders. Yeah. Like, you know, you have a, as a clinician, you have a question, somebody comes in and they say, you know, my kid's hyper-focused, and, you know, they exhibit these kinds of, um, you know, problems. And then your question as a clinician is, okay, well, you know, it's same with spectrum. Was it present when they were three and four and five? And right. when did you start to see it develop? So you ask sort of a develop for a developmental history. That's why we do that. Um, if it wasn't present, you know, uh, until high school, it was either very mild and latent or it's something else. So a lot of this is just based on research. Thank you for explaining. And as you can see, it's, there are many criteria that need to be met in order for it to be a clinical diagnosis. That does not mean that kids are not struggling with all of these things and that we as parents um, and clinicians um, need to help them you know, better manage it just because it's not a diagnosis. And okay. that's an important point because you know, what we're here for is this is not just about if your kid has ADHD. Right. It's about whether they have inattention or any of the things that Debbie's talking about. You know, there's ways, there's better and worse ways of dealing with that. And so the whole point of today is what are the better ways? Right. So in terms of um, DSM criteria for uh, diagnoses, um, symptoms of inattention are as follows. So failing to give close attention to details um, or making careless mistakes in schoolwork or work, other activities. Um, difficulty holding attention on tasks or even in play activities, um, not seeming to listen or hear when spoken to, um, not being able to follow or often not being able to follow through on instructions, um, failing to finish schoolwork or chores, um, trouble organizing tasks and activities, avoiding or being reluctant to do things that they um, don't like, like schoolwork, um, losing things that are necessary for tasks, losing their belongings, their materials, um, being easily distracted and forgetful in daily activities. And so you would want to see six or more of these on this list or the next list that I'm going to show you, which um, is related to hyperactivity. So the symptoms of hyperactivity, um, fidgeting um, with feet and hands, um, moving around in your seat, being getting up from your seat, leaving situations unexpectedly, running, climbing when it's not appropriate. For adolescents, this manifests in just like a general feeling of restlessness, um, not being kind of comfortable in your own skin. Um, unable to play or take part of leisure activities in a kind of quiet or appropriate manner. Um, kids that are hyperactive are often described as um, on, a go, on the go as if driven by a motor, um, talking excessively, blurting out answers um, before the question has been completed, trouble waiting for their turn. A lot of times you see this um, like in playing uh, board games when you know kids are younger, um, and interrupting or intruding um, on others, whether in conversation or in games. Okay, so this is really why we're here. What are the coping skills that um, parents can use to help their children who have weaknesses in either attention um, or executive functioning? So I think um, the positive reinforcement from my perspective and what I've observed clinically is probably the most critical um, one on this list, although they're all equally important. And the reason why I say that is because Rand alluded um, to this earlier, it's incredibly taxing and frustrating for parents and families when there are difficulties. And um, it is a very common response to get angry at your kids because they're not doing their homework or they're not complying or, or listening. Um, and I always describe to parents that 
if your child is not doing their homework or these things, something must be getting in the way. So if you think about the fact, um, if we think about it as a capacity issue, and if there's a weakness and there's something getting in the way of them being able to do it, yelling at them and being punitive is, is a terrible experience for them. Um, so the positive reinforcement is really, really important. Um, setting clear expectations, having consistent routines. If you think about the um, symptoms uh, that I listed before, um, you know, trouble with organizing, trouble with um, planning, they need clear expectations, they need consistent routines. Visual schedules and checklists are really, really important and very helpful to use um, multi, you know, um, modal learning. Um, use of timers, alarms, uh, apps, they don't have an internal kind of structure, right, in the way that somebody without these weaknesses do. So they need external scaffolding to help them. That's why the timer or the alarm or the visual schedule is so important. Um, encouraging movement is particularly, particularly relevant for the um, kids who have the hyperactivity. Um, movement and exercise is really, really helpful. Um, and just a quick note on that. I, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time and um, have worked with lots of parents who have said, like, I just want, um, you know, my kid to, like, sit still and, like, sit down and do their homework. Um, and they're always kind of amazed when I say, well, why not let them move around when they're studying? You know, and it's like, no, but that's not what they're supposed to do. I'm like, well, and so I once encouraged um, a kid that I saw to um, hit a, a hoop on the back of his um, door to shoot baskets while he was studying. And I don't think his parents were so happy about that recommendation. Um, it really worked, right? He needed to be moving while he was studying. So this idea of like, you know, just sitting still in like this, you know, quiet environment, that's not what worked for them. Um, and every kid is different. Can I make a, a sort of underline a point because I think it's really important um, is, um, how are we doing on time, by the way? I want to be careful. Uh, we're okay. Um, it's about 9.20 right now. Yeah. So we had about an hour, um, so you put 9.45. Okay, all right. So just quickly, um, you know, this is a really important point, the first point that Debbie made about sort of positive reinforcement. Um, I'll give you a completely different sort of contextual example, but I had a family that I was talking to last night, and you know, the kid is showing a lot of frequent temper tantrums. Their other kid was a very sort of controlling kid for a period of time. Um, and a tendency can be, okay, my kid is being disrespectful and rude and having temper tantrums. You know, I'm going to punish them because they're not doing what they should be doing. And I said, look, we've been through this before with your other kid. Let's take a different approach here. Let's look at what might be causing the temper tantrums and think about that. This is a kid who, um, at very, you know, she's seven now and she started to show symptoms of OCD. Um, so that's why it's a different example, but the, the, con the message is the same. Um, like when she was four or five. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is a kid with OCD like and what are their vulnerabilities and weaknesses? And one of the things that happens with kids with OCD is that when you interrupt their um, plan, their rituals, they get very upset because the rituals are designed to create a sense of okayness and calmness. You interrupt that, they're very tense. And so as you work on those things, you can see meltdowns in other areas, and she's working with somebody. And so I said to the parents, well, maybe this isn't just disrespectful and rude, maybe this is a situation where your child doesn't have the capacity right now to maintain their sort of balance, and they, get, they, they just have very low tolerance for anything that doesn't go their way. If we can see it that way, instead of them being disrespectful and rude, the approach to dealing with it is completely different. And that's what Debbie's talking about in terms of understanding your kid. It goes back to sort of knowing your kid, what I said in the very beginning. It makes the, it a world of difference. It can change everything. Um, 
providing a structured environment, um, modeling and teaching self-regulation. So that also, I think, is really key because um, we already know that um, kids with these weaknesses have a tendency to um, struggle with their own self-regulation. They get easily frustrated. Um, and we also know that parents get very frustrated with these dynamics, but that's not modeling for our children um, what to do when you feel frustrated. Um, so that's particularly important. Um, validation, um, you know, validation is the um, ability to understand what somebody is feeling. Um, it seems really simplistic, right? I think it's probably one of the hardest skills that I work on with parents, um, both in their relationships with their partners and with their kids. And the reason why is that validation does not mean agreement. So when you have a kid who's throwing a temper tantrum because they're frustrated over you know, homework, because they're struggling with you know, attention and stuff, um, you may not agree with their behavior. You might think like you're being disrespectful, you're not listening, um, and parents find it very hard to validate the experience in that moment because they think that if they do, they're somehow kind of giving permission or um, agreeing with the behavior. That's not the case. You can really recognize, I understand that this is hard for you and that you're having a hard time doing this. I, it's not helpful to throw, you know, the plate, <laughs> um, and, and of course there has to be consequences for that kind of stuff, but validation is very important and it's very, very hard for parents to do. Um, modeling and teaching po uh, positive problem solving strategies and breaking down and prioritizing tasks. I mean, we could spend a long time on each one of these, but we don't have time, so we'll try to fly through some examples. Um, so in this example, um, the, the presenting problem, as we've talked a lot about today already, is completing homework assignments because this really comes up so frequently. Um, in this example, Sarah is a 13-year-old with attentional weakness. She has trouble completing her homework assignments. She gets easily distracted. Um, she can't focus on the task at hand. She often forgets to bring home her binder or the materials that she needs to do the work. Then she gets super frustrated. And now homework time is a prolonged battle um, at home with parents. So the question is, how can Sarah's parents help her? So the first would be establishing a daily homework routine. Consistency and structure with kids who have EF weaknesses or attentional problems is paramount. Um, that means when are you doing your homework? Are you doing it at the same time every day? Are you doing it in the same place every day? Um, using visual schedules or checklists to outline tasks. Yes? Um, one thing I wanted to ask about was social media and phones. Yes. I think of how that plays in, especially with teenagers. Totally. Yeah. So, and, and I um, reference it in a later slide okay. in terms of how, no, it's a really important point of how to, um, help develop good study habits. I mean, it's it's evil, right? I mean, it is the ultimate distraction, and I think everybody in here probably can attest to the fact that it's hard as an adult to um, kind of resist the urge. And so, again, with um, computers, phones, I, you need your computer for the work, but I would not have the phone anywhere near um, where your child is doing the work. I would, I, and that's a battle as kids get older. Um, do not disturb. It's it's too hard, and they think that they're multitasking, um, but what's happening is they're getting distracted and they're going back and forth, and it's taking longer to complete their work, and the um, accuracy is decreased. So we can also talk more about that if we have time. It's a great question. Um, the visual schedules and the checklists. Um, so quickly, a point about that. Um, again, these kids don't have necessarily have an internal structure or scaffolding, so we need to use external prompts and cues. I find this an interesting one because when I work with kids, I will often say, like, let's write out a schedule or let's make a checklist, and they'll say to me, I know everything that I have to do. And they can, they can rattle it off, right? 
Um, or they say, well, it's posted online, and they can check it, and yet they're still not able um, to do it. Why? Because it needs to be presented in concrete information, you know, in a concrete way. It's not that they don't know what to do. They need to be able to look at it, to see it, and it needs to be broken down into smaller tasks um, because otherwise the urge to avoid goes through the roof because it becomes very overwhelming. So you want small, manageable chunks. So the question is with an older child, do you get them to do that themselves? Yes. Instead of spoofing it? Because I mean, I'm not going to do a checklist, but you need them to do the checklist. Yes, and so what you want to do is you want to model it, you want to teach it, you want to suggest it, and then yes, the idea is that they're going to do it themselves. And you shouldn't be making a checklist for a kid in high school. It's not, you know. Um, but again, it's a capacity and a skill issue. So somebody needs to teach them and also help them understand why it would be so helpful for them, right? Um, the other part of kind of the self-esteem, you know, issue that you referred to before in terms of, um, you know, how easy it is for kids to create these narratives, you know, for themselves around like being stupid. Um, we want to empower them to say like, this is a vulnerability. Right? And so, but there's strategies that you can use to compensate, and that can really fuel confidence. Um, celebrating progress along the way to boost motivation is essentially just that. Um, minimizing distractions. Um, so, and I'll talk in a few minutes about creating a, a study space. The bedroom is really not a great place for that. Um, we talked about using timers and alarms. Um, already, especially for somebody that gets easily distracted, um, you want um, external cues and reminders of when they should stop, when they should take a break. Um, collaborating with teachers is um, always helpful and recommended. In terms of um, EF weaknesses, an example um, for somebody um, younger or older um, would be difficulty organizing morning routines. In this example, it happens to be an eight-year-old boy, Alex, um, who has trouble completing his morning routine. So he forgets to pack his school bag, he gets distracted when he's getting dressed, um, he becomes overwhelmed by all the things that his parents are saying, did you do this, did you do this, do you remember this? Um, and this results in frequent tardiness and stress for Alex and his parents. This I see all the time with families that I work with. Um, mornings become kind of like the dreaded um, you know, part of the day for families. Um, so how can Alex's parents help him? Again, the visual uh, checklist is really, really key. And for that, you want to have very few things on the list. If there's like eight or nine things on the list, that's not helpful. If it's very simple, you know, pack your bag, brush your teeth, make your bed, whatever, you, you know, your family is, you can see it and you can redirect the child to it. Did you finish that? Because what we do as parents, often unintentionally, is have the expectation that they can hold all the information in their head. And we think it's like, how hard is it to remember? Like, you know what it is that you're supposed to do, but we want to provide them with an external, concrete um, reminder. The, the timers and reminders, I already talked about reducing the tasks. Um, the when-then structure um, is really, really, helpful, I think. Most parents do the, if you, you know, complete your homework, you can watch TV type thing. I do not believe in the if then, I believe in the when then. So it is when you complete your homework, you can watch TV. And the reason is that it changes, first of all, like kind of like the punitive nature of it but also it shifts the um, responsibility and the ownership on the child. So like, you're if, if you don't complete your homework, you're choosing not to watch TV. Like, you, you can watch TV when you finish your homework. Um, so when then structures are really helpful, especially for morning routines. Um, this is a, an example um, that is probably more applicable to um, high school kids, um, forgetfulness, disorganization, poor time, time management. Ella, who's a high school junior, has difficulty keeping track of assignments and deadlines, even though all the assignments are posted online. 
Um, so now she's missing assignments, now her grades are decreasing, she's procrastinating, she's rushing through assignments, um, she's cramming for tests, she feels incompetent, frustrated, um, and has low self-esteem, and you can imagine how parents are reacting. You're a junior, you have to get good grades because you need to go to college, and you know it, it can really be an unpleasant situation at home. So I went into much more detail here um, about how Ella's parents can help her. So to your point before about like not doing it for them, but teaching, you wanna teach time management um, skills such as prioritizing tasks, taking into account due dates, the difficulty of the task and the time needed to complete the task. We need to model this for our children. We need to help them say, okay, like what do you have to do and let's break it down. What is the perhaps the hardest, most challenging task or the one that takes the longest period of time? If you have attentional weakness, you want to target that one first. You do not want to put it off until the end of your day where your attention is even further decreased. Um, you want to be able to help teach them how to assign um, time estimations to these tasks. So because time management and planning is a, a difficulty um, for both executive function and attention. So how long do I really need in order to complete these tasks? Um, using tools like timers and apps we've already talked about. The breaking the study sessions into shorter sessions and being super specific <coughs> about active versus passive strategies. Um, so when I taught uh, study skills at Riverdale Country School, this was like the biggest thing that I talked about active versus passive. Don't say, I have to study for biology. What does that mean, study? Um, I have to answer the questions in the back of the textbook. I have to rewrite my notes. Um, you know, anything that is passive is not particularly helpful. It's also too vague, so there's a tendency to avoid, right? I just, but if you have a very clear task, I have to answer these 10 questions, um, it's much easier um, to manage. Providing emotional support and encouragement um, about strengths and accomplishments rather than focusing solely on difficulties. So in my experience, the kids that struggle with um, all of these things, they feel really badly about themselves because the fighting that happens at home with parents makes them feel criticized, right? I'm not, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you're not listening, you're, you know, they feel in trouble. And so, you know, the positive reinforcement that we talked about before is so, so important. Um, we want to empower these kids, right? We want them to understand that everybody learns differently, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. What can we do to compensate for our areas of weakness? And then, of course, um, the model in um, problem solving and um, the importance of perseverance and effort. Um, this is just a quick list. That you can, um, I don't have to go into detail about it, about how to help develop um, healthy work habits. A study-only space um, that limits distractions is super helpful. Organizing, you know, for younger kids, you can organize the homework station, but you want to have, like, a clutter-free area that has all the kind of tools and resources accessible. Um, it's not a great idea to study in the bedroom, although all high schoolers will close their door or in middle schoolers and say that's where they want to study. Um, there's two kind of reasons why it's typically not helpful. One is because they get into bed. And, and I don't know about you, but as soon as I get into bed, I'm so tired. Um, so that's not great for kind of focus. Um, and also, there's a lot of stress involved um, with these kids and homework in school, and we want the bedroom to be a, like a place of you know refuge, not associated kind of with that stress. I often tell kids actually if there's not a space in the um, home, I encourage them to even after school go to Starbucks, go to the library, go somewhere to complete their work before coming home because kids with these vulnerabilities often struggle once they get home um, because there's so many distractions. Um, Turning do not disturb on the computer um, to your you know question before, placing the phone in another room, making a study schedule, adding breaks, fueling the brain with health healthy snacks. I actually added in there because you know it's really, really important, um, especially for kids who are struggling in this in this way. 
when you're depleted, it's very hard to focus when you don't have the right fuel um, and kind of high sugar and this not a diet talk, but like it's just not helpful for attention. Um, understand your child's learning style, as Rand alluded to before, for the family who said, you know, the parents said, I parented all my kids the same way. I don't know what the problem is. That's the problem. Um, every child is different, and one of your children may not have any of these struggles, and you can tell them to go to their room and do their homework, and they can study in bed, and it works, and the other child, not so much. Um, encouraging sleep habits. I would say the single most um, difficult thing that I uh, see with kids is uh, sleep deprivation because it amplifies every vulnerability that they have, period. Whether it's anxiety, attention, um, executive functioning, if you are sleep deprived, you cannot utilize the resources to compensate, period. Okay, when to seek professional help. Um, if there are persistent academic challenges, ongoing behavioral struggles, concern raised by teachers or caregivers, and again, that kind of impact on daily life. I don't know if you want to kind of jump in on the conclusion, but. No, you can. Okay, so basically, you want consistency, you want positive um, support, and, you know, punishing is not helpful. Even though the behavior may be frustrating, you're missing what's driving the behavior, and that's what's key. I was like way too much talking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like the back and forth also better. <laughs> All right, so let me just say a few things and then we'll ask, open it up for questions. Um, so what happens if these, are the, these kinds of problems are left unattended? Um, there's a sort of progression <laughs> as things get worse. Um, kids can become unable to study over extended periods of time. They miss what the teacher's saying. They do poorly on tests, so concrete outcomes. They shy away from academic situations that stretch them. You see this a lot with young kids. They just don't try very hard. And then they don't, I mean, I think the logic is they don't fail if they don't try, and so they don't try. Um, they start to feel that they're different. Um, they don't share this with you, but I've seen it, you know, and kids have told me that when they're sitting there and they're seeing, like I was working with a kid I went to observe at school, he was sitting there, they had a, a, a task on the computer, he would look around and everybody else would just be typing away and he wouldn't know where to get started and he couldn't organize his thinking and he just, like, he's just comparing himself every minute to everybody else in the class. Um, and you develop a sense of self and it leads to a decline in, oops, let me go back, um, self-confidence um, impacts functioning in other areas like social. Like when kids go through this for years and then they become teenagers and everybody's sort of the whole popularity thing is happening and there's clicks and you want to be on top of your game and you've had five years of not feeling great about yourself. It doesn't work very well. Um, and there can be um, comorbidity also, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so when you have ADHD, it often co-occurs, like we've been saying, with other problems. The biggest one is oppositional defiant disorder. I have a theory about that, don't know if it's true, but from a clinical perspective, you know, if you're working with a kid with ADHD and you get into this pattern of yelling and consequences, they don't like it. You know, partly for some of the reasons that we were talking about before. Then they start to rebel and that becomes solidified. So where you started potentially with one problem, now you've got two problems. Like Debbie was saying, anxiety is another big one that co-occurs with ADHD. Um, it's not clear whether what that's all coming from. Um, ADHD is a very heterogeneous set of problems. Um, you know, there could be a biological vulnerability. I mean, we don't really know why exactly things happen the way they do. Um, you know, is the anxiety causing the ADHD? Sometimes is the ADHD causing anxiety because the kid can't complete their work? Sometimes. So. Um, and are the parents, in terms of how they're parenting, causing some of the symptoms? Sometimes. So you, our job, you know, when you bring a kid into the center, we need to figure out what's going on in your particular case. That's why we never use a boilerplate approach. Um, there can be CNS insults, like viruses, you know, or fevers. Um, 
you know, neuroanatomical or genetic. A lot of times, you know, I have a parent, not a lot of times, sometimes, I have a parent who brings their child in and they say, you know, he's all over the place, he can't, he's disorganized, he doesn't follow through on tasks, and part of the task for the parent is to fill out some forms and give them to me so that I can get a sense of what's going on, and they don't fill out all the forms. They fill out, you know, three out of five. Um, oh, I didn't realize I didn't put the, give you the other one. Or some of the forms are the first page is filled out and not the second page. Oh, I didn't know there were two pages. Like, okay, but, um, can we see what's happening here? Um, so I do think that some of this, especially in kids with more severe ADHD, is a wiring issue. You, they walk in the office and, uh, in like within three seconds. You know, they can't sit still, they're going to the window, they're fidgeting. I mean, you know what's going on already. Um, but what we want to do is give them strategies for managing this. This is a lifelong thing. This isn't like, you know, six months. They have to continue to do this and work at this and internalize these strategies and really sort of hold them very close. So the, the question of can you teach them these strategies is really critical. Um, there's other things that can happen. So the ADHD, you know, as things get worse, get, um, get solidified. Um, you know, the parents see their child struggling, they're not handing in homework, they take a more commanding role, they step in more strongly, they make sure that everything is going the right way. Like, you've got college, like, I'm not going to let this happen. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, parents then get frustrated because they become so <coughs> invested in the kid's success and the kid is wired differently. And then they start, you know, there's an increase in conflict. It can create divisions like I was talking about, and we're moving now toward the oppositional piece. And as these solidify, they can have a really enduring impact on how your kids feel about you and how you and your kids interact with each other. And you get resentment and anger on both ends. Um, and then I, I've given other talks about sort of the transition to college. Kids go off to college, and you're not there anymore. And that's how this whole thing for me started, like, OK, we have parents who are very controlling and they're very rigid about what they demand of their kids. Then their kid goes off to college and they don't have, they haven't internalized anything of, like along the lines of what we're talking about. You're not there anymore. They're not going to tell you. You don't see them. You talk to them once a week. Who's going to do all of this shepherding that you were doing before? You have to teach them so that they can internalize all of this. That's what this is about. Um, and the other thing that happens is, I talked about this last time. I think one of the big roles for parents is, like I would call a parent as teacher. My kids are 23 and 26. Um, I'm guessing that they're going to come to me with questions. I hope I'm, you know, like conscious enough. Like when I'm 85, um, they'll always come to you. You're always their parents. You are always a source of advice if you can make yourself useful. If they, if there's a lot of conflict and resentment, they won't come to you. So that when they're off at college and they're by themselves and they don't, you're not right there and you don't see their mood when they come home, they're not going to call you and say, I don't have any friends at college. I don't know what to do. You have to have that channel of communication open. And that's one of the biggest downsides of all of this, is that they can't utilize you. And you guys are so important. That's why we're doing this again. Um, so, um, another downside to all of this is ADHD, there's certain symptoms that get better, typically the hyperactivity and stuff, um, but the inattention can remain for long periods of time. So this is a graph of um, the prevalence of ADHD. This is true ADHD, not just problems, um, you know, in the United States. So adults, there's about a 4% prevalence rate. So Debbie was talking about there's a 10% prevalence rate for kids, but half of those people, the you know ballpark, it doesn't go away. That's a big deal. Like this is 4% of the United States. That's a lot of people. And so, to the extent that you can teach skills, they can internalize those. You can help decrease the number. Um, so, if you have the right skill set, if you know what to do, you can utilize that and potentially prevent the development of more serious problems, and then help your kid manage the diagnosis. It, some of this is about prevention. Some of this is about if I have a kid who has ADHD, can I help them manage things? 
Um, that's what you need to do. Both are important. Um, just quickly, um, we want to do studies at the, I was a researcher at Yale and at NYU, and I like doing research, so we want to do research. So if you guys are interested, there's a, if you go into the Family Development Institute website, there's a place just to click on and we'll call you and give you information about the kind of work that we want to do. And if you want to participate, you can. It's, I think it's a win-win. You learn how to do things, um, you know, going to the workshops, and then we can add some value to the community as well. So this is my contact information. Um, you can reach out to me if you want. You can reach out to me for uh, clinical questions. You can reach out to me for um, talking about the institute piece. Um, that's my cell phone. Um, people call me on my cell phone, it's fine. Uh, texting is actually better, because um, uh, if I'm with people, I won't answer. But um, you can email me. Um, there's contact pages on both the Westchester CAPS website as well as the institute website. So that's it for today. Um, so questions for Debbie and um, I typically don't like sharing. I'll think about it. Um, but um, let me think about what to do with that. It's a it's kind of a question that comes up. Um, um, this will be online. It is. So, so the, the PowerPoint is actually yeah. online. Yeah. It's, um, the first it. talk was online. Yeah. So you can just go onto the website and all of this is there. Well, some no, no, no. It's so the PTSI has a YouTube channel, so we will it is recorded. So once the video, we'll put it there, and we'll send the link out. Thank you. Um, I sorry, I have a question. Do you see a downside of saying to the child like, if you don't give me a hard time doing homework Monday through Thursday, you can have a play date Friday, or get an A on the test and you get to pick the restaurant we go to this week? Do you see a downside to that? Because I do that a lot. So. I'm not um, sure I'm not doing them in the service. Yeah, so actually both of those examples are very different, I think. Um, and if it's a capacity issue, it's a very dangerous like thing to get involved with because, first of all, I would not ever focus on the grades. And that's not to say that um, the grades are not important or that you don't want to set kind of high expectations. Um, but if they, if you say, if you get an A on the test, then you get to do whatever, and they can't get an A on the test, that sends a very um, difficult message. I think that you can do um, some of that with like the when-then stuff, but I'll, I would also be uh, reluctant to make it like a whole week thing, especially um, with kids who are struggling with like, a, you know, attentional stuff, because that's too like big and broad. So I would break it, break it down. You know, the research is pretty clear in terms of like learning and how it works um, in, in behavior. So we, you want to kind of attend to um, and positively reinforce the behavior that you want to continue. So that's a much better way to do it. Like if if your child doesn't give you a hard time, like on Monday, make a big deal about that. You did that was like so you're saying verbally. Yes, and, and you can, you know, you can, you can do it not just verbally. I mean, then you can go and have like a special dinner and be like, "This was really great, and this felt good." You just you want to pay attention to the things that you want to continue. But I I would be um, wary of creating constructs that they can't meet the expectations because something's getting in the way. Because that implies that it's a you know in their control. Yeah. You opened up the presentation saying that 10% of American kids within the age range have ADHD. Is that a significant increase that you've been seeing? I mean, in years prior, where well, that's a pretty, to me, that's a pretty big chunk. Um, so I guess my question was really, is that normal? <laughs> have you seen increases? Yeah, it's a really great question, and you can jump into um, to clarify. Uh, it's 10% of U.S. children ages 3 to 17 have had an ADHD diagnosis, which is slightly different than saying 10 million people have ADHD. Um, that's one thing. Um, I think that there is definitely an increase. I mean, I see in, in, over the kind of 20 plus years in my you know, practice, I've definitely seen an increase. 
how much of that is um, because there's more um, you know, kind of education and destigmatization of this, and also how much of it is because anytime there's an intentional weakness, somebody jumps and says, "My kid has, like, you know, ADHD because there's there's a problem." And I also think just as being like a working parent, you know, the conversation I used to have with my mom was, she was like, "I left the house yeah. and no one can get in touch with me." Yeah. And nowadays we have texts, we have this, we have WhatsApp, we have the emails, work email, personal email, school. Books. Two phones, three phones, it, it's just, just constant that you say to yourself, geez, a lot of those things that you, you brought up on, the, it's just really kind of environmental at this point, you know, and Absolutely. it may have been something you wouldn't have recognized, you know, as we were younger. But the environmental piece, it's it's huge, yeah. Absolutely. Can you talk a bit more about uh, tactics to help mitigate the impact of social media? Tactics to what? To help mitigate the impact of social media. I'm going to give an example. I have my daughter has ADHD. She's young enough. She's not on it, right? So what is? And I think it's a it's a tough question, right? Do you let them go? Do you how do you manage that? Because obviously there's a strong link with you know, self-esteem, which is core also of ADHD. So do you have any recommendations to approach that conversation proactively and then help them manage, right? I mean. So quickly, my thought is, I mean, social media is um, sort of ubiquitous, it's everywhere. We're not getting, we're not going to be able to get away from it, and our kids can't get away from it. But I don't know that, in my opinion, and some parents would disagree with this, my kids would disagree with this to some degree. But, I mean, you know, for kids there's always been um, in groups and out groups, and you see on social media everybody went to the party and I wasn't invited. Well, there's always been parties, and there's always kids who haven't been invited. It's just much more in your face now. Like, you see it instantly. Um, and I think that kids have taken to, you know, all the pictures and all of the publication of how happy they are and how they look when they go to the party and who they're hanging with and all of that. It's become a thing. Um, so that is different, I think. But I think that, you know, you always have to, and this is part of what you teach as a parent, you have to teach sort of perspective and you have to teach understanding that you won't be included in every activity and you won't be liked by everybody and that's just part of life. And in terms of like being glued to it, I think you have to teach self-control and discipline. That has to be something that you teach kids from the age of, you know, three. Um, you know, I'm supposed to give a talk on the transition to college and like, if anybody thinks that I'm going to go in there and say, okay, this is what you do in the three months before they go to college and your kid will be successful, they're absolutely wrong. These are all things that you do throughout life for your kid. And so if you can teach them self-discipline, my kid, my younger kid in particular, has become, become great at, he leaves his phone like in his room and he goes somewhere else to, to do his work. Um, Whenever he's working, he won't answer any questions. It drives my wife nuts um, because she can't get him. He like he'll be working and there's just no response. Um, and um, but somehow he acquired that over time. And um, I didn't even teach it to him, um, you know, except maybe one or two sentences. It's just sort of part of how, like I think I operate and how we operate as a family. Um, when it's work, you do your work. Um, if that can get taught by example, by modeling, like Debbie was saying, it helps. They internalize everything you do, and it starts at age three. And I don't think, I think dealing with social media is, it's hard, really hard, because it's like candy. You know, it's like kids get addicted to it. The more insecure they are, the more vulnerable, and they get more addicted to it, and it has a bigger impact on them. Then you work on self-esteem issues over time. Um, but that's how I would answer. It's just part and parcel of their life, and you want to give them the skills to manage that effectively. Would you add? I would just add, and I think the modeling is really important, because if we're on our you know, phone the whole time and we're scrolling Instagram, as I you know, often do, that's not great modeling. I have two daughters, and they're all you know, 17 and uh, 21. Um, but in addition to modeling, I think that, you know, starting when you can, there has to be limits. Um, you know, so especially, you said, you know, your daughter has ADHD. I mean, 
the uh, capacity, again, going mm -hmm. back to that, um, to self-regulate, to have the self-control, doesn't necessarily exist kind of inherently. So you want to put limits, um, external limits, so that she can learn how to do that. And that could be as simple as, you know, um, there's n a phone is not allowed anywhere near the dinner table. Or, you know, don't take your phone in mm -hmm. your bedroom, you know, to charge overnight or you know times in the day where you, you can't have access to your screens things like that so that but I, think so what, but I think to she is seeking the structure she's wanting to do some work yes and so then to your point it can be um, accepted or you know inserted as part of that structure exactly right? I, I think in to your point i think it is part of how you live with life yeah it's just it's amplified right i think it's the amplification of the Media on everything. I think that's that's what frankly also frightening. So when we say like no phones in the room when you're studying, like some of you are probably saying to yourself, okay, World War Three is about to happen. <laughs> you know, like I'm gonna go home and tell my kid he can't have his phone in his room. I mean, I wouldn't do it exactly right. that way, but I would also say that you know, if World War Three happens, then let it happen. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. It's okay. They'll get over it. Um, but it takes a lot of perseverance and courage. How important is it to allow your child to try something and fail? Because I think it's really important. Um, you want to let them fail at things that aren't life changing, however. So the things that, you know, like um, not showing up for the um, SAT or the ACT on time, that has a huge impact on their future course. But I think it's really important. And I think you need to have conversations with your kids about, um, okay. Like, you want privileges to stay out later at night or to drive the car when they get to be 16. Um, okay, I'll give you those privileges. Um, you have to understand that this is what our expectations are, and if you don't sort of work within that, you lose the privilege for a period of time. So you give them as much rope as you can while, being, while ensuring that they're safe, and then you let them fail. And if they fail, you need to stick to the consequences. If there are extenuating circumstances that are very clear and dramatic, then okay. But if they are used to having consequences when they don't, when they fail, it won't knock them off their chair. And I think it's really critical because they'll say to themselves, "Okay, I blew it. I understand. We have the agreement beforehand. It is what it is. Like next time, I won't do that." So the whole issue of kids learning from their mistakes is really important. We have a kid that I'm, a family that I'm working with where the kids are very hyperactive, very oppositional, very much ADHD, and the parents would walk them through their morning routine so they could get out the door. These are younger kids every day. Okay, let's go brush our teeth. And they'd actually help them brush their teeth. I mean, things get really crazy. Um, Nine-year-old, you're brushing their teeth. Um, okay, here's what you need to get dressed. Put your socks on, put your pants on, um, and I said, no, stop, all of it, stop all of it. Well, they're gonna be late for school. Okay, they're gonna be late for school. And then the principal or the teacher will have a conversation with them, which is exactly what happened. And kids don't like when the, the teacher, they're still an authority figure, the teacher says, this is not okay. It's being rude and disrespectful to me and your other classmates. They will learn from their mistakes, hopefully. That's the value of what you're saying, and I think it's really critical. I just, can I just add also that um, natural consequences as opposed to imposed consequences tend to have a much bigger impact. Um, so, you know, right. taking the phone away, okay, they don't like that. Um, but if they get suspended from school because, you know, they've been late however many times, that's a, mu you know, the school does that. And that's a natural consequence. Or if you don't study, and you fail your test, like that's a natural consequence, um, as opposed to you're in trouble with me because you know you got a bad grade or you didn't do your homework. Um, when my kids were young, I was terrible at consequences. Like I, it, my first go-to was, okay, you're not getting dessert tonight. Like, <laughs> okay, like that's really bad strategy. Um, but it's the easy. It was the easiest thing for me to think of. Like I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Right. You know, and so what we ended up having was a conversation about, I don't want to deal with this, you know? Like, 
you need to either behave yourself or you know like something else beside treats and desserts and stuff. I, but it's hard. But I do think the natural consequence piece is really helpful. What do you think for um, for teenagers about uh, like parental controls on the phone? You know, like you can limit like their hours or their social media hours. And curious about like, something I struggle with, frankly, is just whether to use that or to let my child, you know, sort of figure it out how to balance herself as she's a high schooler and you know I don't want to be micromanaging or brushing her teeth or whatever. You know, I want to. It depends on how extreme yeah. it gets. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. So you know. If you have a conversation with your kids and you say, look, this is what we're shooting for, and get them to agree with you. This is what we want to see happen. We're not seeing that happen. Tell them beforehand. If we don't see that happen, you're forcing us. I don't want to do this. You're forcing me to take a, a position of limiting what you can do. I don't want to do that. You have to self-regulate. But if you can't, then I'm put into a position where I have to take over that role for you temporarily. I don't want to do that, but that's what you're forcing me to do. And this is what it will look like. So whatever it takes, you know, I mean, there, I've heard of kids, I don't know them personally, but where they're, you know, nine hours on playing video games. You know, that's just not okay. I mean, you can't just let that happen. There's times where as a parent you have to step in and say, no, not happening. Will they like that? Absolutely not. Okay, sorry, that's my job. Um, so I think it depends on how severe, and then whatever steps you have to take as a parent, then you take them. I took uh, two questions. One was, uh, you said the hyperactivity component for girls may present differently. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? And then you also suggested that the executive issues versus can be present without the attention problem, mm -hmm. what that would look like, mm -hmm. and would you approach it differently? Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Um, so I'll address the latter first. Um, you would not approach it um, differently, really, because the symptoms, there's so many overlaps, right? And if you think about the strategies, they're very um, similar, just in terms of like consistency and modeling and positive reinforcement, so I wouldn't treat them differently. Um, you know, inattention and hyperactivity looks different in every child. So it, typically, you know, um, in a boy with kind of overt hyperactivity, you're going to see like behavioral problems, you're going to see them bouncing off the walls or like being rough. And, but in um, females, and you know, this is an oversimplification, you'll often see um, it uh, manifest in restlessness, in anxiety, in um, internal distractions in you know symptoms like um, nail biting or you know finger picking or um, so if it presents differently um, it doesn't mean it's not there. Good question. Um, you kind of touched a little bit on it when your child comes and like why is it so easy for everybody else in the classroom and they're doing really good and they're getting the assignments done and I'm struggling so much and I'm putting so much effort and I'm not doing as well. Like, how, how do you how do you tackle that? Like what do you answer to that? I mean I'll just say quickly and let Debbie answer. Um, but I mean, my quick answer would be, well, you know, there's certain things that are hard for you and they're um, not as hard for other people. That's okay. Um, you have to work at those things. There are other things that you're good at that other people aren't good at. Some kids are good at sports. They're good at basketball and not at football. Um, other kids are good at you know academics, and other kids are good at singing and creative arts and stuff like that. Everybody's different. You have to sort of understand what your differences are as a kid, and sort of you know buttress the weaknesses and sort of leverage the strengths. And so that's how I would answer. What would you say? I would answer that way also, and in addition, I would say that the validation in, in, in that um, scenario is really key, which is, you know, I can understand and imagine how frustrating it must be to kind of look around and, and see people, like, seemingly, doesn't mean that it is easy for everybody else, um, and, you know, also to say, okay, well, let's focus on their strengths, obviously, um, but, okay, what can, we, what can we do about this? Because the idea is not, 
okay, this is hard for you, and that's the end of the story. This is hard for you, um, and there's something that we can do about it. Here are some things that we're going to do, um, and be proactive about empowering them to kind of, again, compensate for areas that are not don't come as naturally. And certain things are weaknesses at certain points in time, and their strengths at other times. So I've got people who are, you know, had um, hyperactivity as a kid. And they are now a salesman, and they're talkative, and they're out and you know talking to people all the time, and they're doing great. And you know somebody like me would be probably a terrible salesman. Um, you know I um, I'm more introverted, and so I wouldn't. You know I'm not talkative. I'm not out I, out there all the time. You know um, I like to have substantive conversations with people. I go to parties, and I, I mean I I'm fine, uh, absolutely, but. I'm not the life of the party and talking to everybody and going from one person to the next. Um, so what is a weakness at certain ages can become a strength at other ages. And I would say that to them too. I would also just quickly add to that with, um, because, I, well, both my kids have attentional problems, but my younger daughter in particular, um, who has ADHD, is the most creative person. And I always tell her that her ADHD is her superpower. So really focusing and celebrating the strengths that are associated with it. Just because it's a vulnerability doesn't mean that there are wonderful things um, about having attentional weaknesses. If you want a great movie, The Disruptors is a great movie that talks about that. If you've seen, it's not like Netflix, I think. I have two questions. Um, kind of touches a little bit on what this parent had talked about and everything that you presented is very informative. But is there a downside to recognizing ADHD or executive functioning as a weakness or a disability given evolutionary context, society context? Like, it's really only this last century that we now just sit still for eight hours in front of a school, whether it's work or school. I mean, we were hunter-gatherers the majority of our existence. I'm just saying, is it really, is there any negative consequence to really calling it a disability or weakness? And or is there something about the way we teach in school that doesn't apply to certain individuals and it's not a weakness or a disability? It's just that they are coded differently, wired differently from an evolutionary perspective and our society's current constraints don't match up. I'm just well, it's a good question. It's a big question. You know, like, um, I mean, I would say that at any point in time, you're at an advantage if you can adapt to your current circumstance. Our current circumstance is what you just articulated. Is it good or bad? Um, I would probably, given my own personal biases, argue in favor of what, where you're going with this is like there are other ways for us to live our lives that would probably be better for people, but this is our current way of life. Um, I don't think there's another piece that's embedded in what you're saying which has to do with sort of diagnoses and disabilities, and I don't see that as terribly helpful. Um, I do think it's important and helpful to identify what, whatever word you want to use, um, weaknesses, you know, or traits. Don't even call them weaknesses. I mean, I have a, a kid who I'm working with, um, two kids, but one is on the spectrum. Like you could say, okay, you know, you're autistic. Is that helpful? Absolutely not. Is it helpful to say, um, you know, you, you can be very rigid in your thinking at times, and you are overreactive, and you need to develop certain capabilities so that when things don't go the way you want, or you, you know, you're, he has very difficult time talking about his emotions and sort of opening up, very closed. Um, big emotions and very closed, and that doesn't end well because he has meltdowns. Now he's transitioning into college, um, but um, so I think it's helpful for kids to be told what their strengths and weaknesses are. I don't think it's like diagnoses for us are helpful because they organize our thinking as clinicians um, and maybe even as parents so you know what coping strategies to, to teach your kids because kids like this typically don't have them and I see the same thing in my kid. 
giving him a diagnosis or her, I don't know that that's terribly helpful. Um, I do think it's important to be, to adapt to your environment. Um, I mean, I would love to change a lot about our life as a, you know, civilization, a society. And like in Europe, it's, there's a lot of things that are different than here. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are better than here. Um, how to do that? Don't know. Um, I'm probably not going to be successful at it. Um, my second follow-up question is a little bit unrelated, just curious to know, are there any studies, just because some of this touches on working memory and forgetfulness, are there any studies or connections for later in life to dementia or Alzheimer's? Because that's already kind of an area that's been identified as someone struggling with. What area later in life? Dementia, dementia Alzheimer's. I don't know. So I don't know of any studies. It's a really interesting question. Um, you know, working memory is different than um, long-term memory. It's holding and manipulating information in your head kind of temporarily so that you can complete a task. So I'm not sure um, what the connections might be, but I, I don't know. It's a good question. So. I know this workshop is about parents, what we can do, but we're in a school setting and our yeah. kids are at school for many hours mm -hmm. a day. Is it just individual based on your kid and you work with the teachers or administration for your kid? Or is it like, how do you handle, like, I don't know. We have a first grader who I'm getting phone calls about, about behavior and stuff. And it's very frustrating. But how do I deal with it? How do you partner with the school? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think it depends in part on what the um, kind of presenting issue is, but is your frustration that the school is not like responding to it or? Just a little bit that it gets thrown back on me, but I'm not with him when he's at school and I'm not encouraging bad behaviors on him. Sure. And it, it's a little bit like looking at me like, I don't really know what the answer is, I don't know. Are you doing something? They're looking at you like, do something? Yeah, yeah do something like, well, about this. If I was at school with him, I feel like it would be a lot different. Right. You know, if I was in the classroom sitting with him, but I'm not, and so I don't know. So I think it depends on the school district and what the, how responsive they are going to be. We've done things like, we often, with kids who have school problems, we'll have a channel of communication with the school. So we'll get updates on where, you know, what they're doing that's helpful, and in the process of that. Sometimes it's easier with a third party on the outside. So we'll say to the, um, you know, the school, we're working with this kid on A, B, and C. We want your input. It helps them feel like, okay, somebody's listening to us. They're taking the right steps to help their kid. Um, and um, I want to partner with them. And so if you can create that kind of partnership atmosphere with the school, I think it can be very helpful with the kid. And it's actually very helpful for helpful for the kid in terms of teaching, but it's also helpful for the kid in terms of their place and how they're regarded by the school. Like if you have a long history of a kid having problems in school, they can become the kid, you know, and by like eighth grade, they're the kid. And every time they do something, okay, here he goes again, or here she goes again. And they develop a, a, a reputation and not a helpful one. And so if you can sort of, you know, what we found is sort of reset things and say, okay, blank slate. We recognize these issues. Let's see if they're making, we can help them make progress. This is what we are doing with your child, with your, you know, mom's child. And, um, but this is what you as teachers can do. This is what we think you as teachers could do differently that would be helpful for this kid. Can we do that? Is that an option? So you can actually create kind of a parents, clinician, school, all working in the same way, using the same vocabulary, and the kid, it makes it much easier for them to internalize things. Are there like teacher workshops for the teachers to like, I was just like, to figure out to like, identify the... It seems like they always throw it back on us. I know. Well, actually, I was asked yesterday to do a series of workshops on different things, and you know, they, they heard about the Institute, and yes, we can.
they said there aren't very many resources in Westchester for that kind of uh, thing, but, and I said to myself, oh, that's great. I mean, we can do this. So maybe, I'm it, hoping. It's unfortunate, but in the private schools, they do a lot of professional development around this. And as you said, the resources uh, are more limited uh, in Westchester. I have a question about resilience. I see a lot of resilience in my child. But at the same time, I'm wondering if he just doesn't care. <laughs> you mean like take, take um, setbacks and just keep going? Right. Yeah. Whether it's that's external. Such a, that's or such a great thing for life. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you know, yeah. I wonder. If the resilience is actually more important than anything. Right. Yeah. So I embrace the resilience, but then I'm wondering, well, is it just really another thing at times? Sometimes it is. And other times it's, I'm hoping, just resilience. Well, I think there's a difference between resilience and not caring. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make that sort of mm -hmm. fine distinction. What is this really? Right. And it can be a combination sometimes. And sometimes, like, I, I don't care. I got to be. I don't really care. Right. Like, okay. I mean, but that isn't resilience. That's sort of not caring about your grades, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Right. You know, I mean, I think we put too much emphasis on grades. The reason that we do it is because there's such a big, you know, sort of consequence, um, you know, at the end of this, you know, college and can have an impact on the future. So I think as a parent, you know, you need to sort of tease those two things out. And it's hard for me to answer in the abstract. I mean, I have to like kind of know your kid, but I think that's the distinction you want to make in your head and then even have a conversation with him about, you know, this isn't really resilience. This is like you just don't care about doing this. Let's be clear about it, at least. I think it would be good for you to do this. This is the reasons why. Um, these were the consequences, but you know, I mean, you're doing okay. I think you could do much better making up the context. Um, so it's hard to know in the abstract, but that would be the question. And the one last thing that I just wanted to say, you, you talk about modeling at home, and with the merge of home now and work and life, it's really hard at 3 o'clock you want to give your work away to welcome your children home and get their afternoon and day started, but then there's two hours of work that you need to figure out how you're going to do. So I always have the conversations with my kids, like, they have a sick bit, well, you were upstairs working, which I was because I took three hours out of my day to do something, you know, and I try to put it in a way where they don't feel guilty about it, obviously. But it's really challenging, you know, to have that merge now at home. You know, my husband works full time from home. I have the flexibility as well that never would have happened before COVID. So it's different for all of us. But how to manage it, yeah, it's a lot. It is. Yeah. And modeling's hard. Yeah, it is. Because if you could just get that one text out, it solves a whole problem that happens overnight. You're seeing it, right? So. Right. I mean, some of this is just away. life as we live it now. Yeah. But I do think that you can sort of have conversations with your kid that we don't always do along the lines of, okay, you're right. I mean, I'm upstairs for two hours, you know, uh, right before dinner. This is why. Explain yeah. as a parent, like, why you're doing what you're doing. If you can figure out some other way of doing this, then tell me. Yeah, you know. exactly what right. said. Right. I got some good feedback, so right. I'll okay. incorporate that in. Okay. But right. to your point, the kids are sponges. They see everything, they, see everything. they hear everything, and they interpret everything. And you got to be really you know, open with communication to make sure that it's all taken away. But if something makes Absolutely. sense, the two hours, then it makes sense. Yeah. And they have to learn to tolerate the disappointment. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about like well, the COVID and working from home, but just to your point, there's also I think we need to do a better job at setting boundaries around that, mm -hmm. um, and that's an important modeling for our kids. And or you know, in order to be able to kind of stop and say, okay, like yes, I'm working from home, but like it's time for dinner, or um, so that's a that's a whole that's other topic. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.